No. This is really unbelievable. In 1985, like 18 million other people in Britain, I watched Dennis Taylor beat Steve Davis in what was not only the greatest world snooker final ever, but also one of the golden moments of late-night television. For the sport of snooker, which a generation earlier had been the preserve of the indolent and underemployed, it ushered in a golden era of popularity. He's done it! Dennis Taylor, for the first time, becomes Embassy World Snooker Champion 1985. But while Taylor celebrated, a quiet revolution was beginning on the other side of the world. When we went there, we were absolutely amazed because there's like 3,000 people in this arena watching us and we're thinking, we didn't know they were interested in snooker in China. We saw some fantastic and spectacular bicycle crashes in the bicycle lane when one person decided he wanted to turn right, and there was just carnage. But everybody just got quietly back on their bikes and went all about their business. When the players go out to China, they really are treated like film stars and thronging crowds, and obviously it's watched by tens of millions of people on TV right across Asia, so snooker is massive in China. More people play snooker in China now than all of the rest of the countries in the world put together. The, the one thing that, that any emerging nation or emerging snooker nation needs to do is create their own stars, and of course with Ding and people like that, you know, they have created now a national awareness for snooker where their players are competing and winning against the best in the world. You know, normal people, they're just playing. They meet friends there, they talk business in the snook club. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, snook very healthy in China. I did the first show in 1983 in the Great Hall of the People. I remember doing Steve Davis against Rex Williams in a billiard challenge specifically for the Chinese government and we had the whole Chinese government there who were all in their 80s, all walking around with a young lady helping them to their seat, most of them incontinent. We had to stop the game every 10 minutes while they went to the toilet, I remember. Uh, and it was all very respectful, very hush-hush, very private. The snooker side was much more for the people. In the 1980s, Barry Hearn was the ringmaster of the modern game and was quick to spot opportunities far beyond the shores of Britain. Oh, in those days, I mean, all you saw was bikes and uh, coaches and cabs. You know, you never saw so many private cars. Obviously, the country was uh, in the early stages of its, uh, well, development, I suppose, you know, into a major industrial force, and uh, it was sparse. Hardly any decent hotels and infrastructure was poor. Communications, just obviously one major TV network. Uh, you know, really the dark ages. You have to understand in those days that snooker in the early days had been predominantly centred around Shanghai, you know, which is a more western port, if you like, where there was... Uh, but the game of snooker and billiards was outlawed by the Chinese government for many, many years uh, and actually was always played sort of in dark corners. Hearn's matchroom management agency could boast many of the game's top players, including the very best in the world, Steve Davis. Back in 1986, something like that, I think we got a, a bit of a, a sort of a lead that somebody wanted to see snooker in China. We had no idea what to expect when we got there. Um, I think the first time I ever played perhaps was in Shanghai, and um, we got taken along to the hotel as guests of honour. Um, red carpet treatment everywhere, although we, it was like, you know, tough to get into the country at that time. You used all sorts of visas and things, uh, much more than you do now. And I do remember the funniest thing was that uh, the players were put in certain rooms, but the referee, Len Ganley, got the best room in the hotel, because as far as they were concerned, he was the most important person, being one of the officials. And uh, that was strange, but great, great fun. The snooker, they loved it, and uh, obviously they had had some sort of table ball game on the streets for many years before that. But um, they were the early days, um, and it's amazing that it takes a long time before a country starts to reach uh, maturity with players. So you know, from '85, 
They were the first seeds. Not all the time, but they've been watching snooker from televised stuff since then. And now we're in a situation where it looks like we're getting a, a swathe of players coming through that are likely to um, break into the top 32, 64, certainly. <laughs> It's hard to imagine Ray Rin holding the Oxford Union in rapture with his rendition of Club Tropicana, but when former world champion Peter Ebden sang Angels to students at a university in Beijing, he was surprisingly well received. Then again, this is China, and the Chinese like to see their stars beyond the confines of dimmed lights and green bays. Peter, how big is snooker in China? Oh, it's absolutely massive. To be perfectly honest, when the players go out to China, they really are treated like film stars, and, and it really is amazing. I mean, they watch our tournaments in the early hours of the morning, don't they? I mean, millions tuning in at, like, 3 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, ab absolutely. And obviously, when there are two Chinese players involved, especially in a big match tournament, uh, I think when Ding played um, Liang Wenbo in the first round of the World Championship last year, or second round, whichever it was, I think there were more than 150 million people watching live, which is just incredible. It, it's great news for snooker because, um, you know, the Chinese Association and powers that be out there take the live feed from the big tournaments and, you know, it's, it's spreading the gospel of snooker, so to speak. I mean, the game has gone through a little bit of a dip I in the UK. Is China the future? I suppose that there is a very good chance that eventually the World Championship may be uh, staged out there, but uh, I think Sheffield uh, City Council would love to hold on to the World Championship, as would the Crucible Theatre. Um, it's been synonymous as the home of snooker for a long, long time now, and there's something very, very special about the Crucible and indeed uh, Sheffield, which... Well, it's good shot there from, from Dink. But, um, they do take it very, very seriously in China, and I'm sure that there black, will be more times in the future. A little bit higher up the table than maybe you would have wanted. There's a big snooker following in China, as we know, but uh, certainly in Europe, the game is big now. The one thing so that any the emerging that nation, emerging should emerging flourish. nation needs to do is create their own stars. It's all very well looking at the, the world's best, but you don't ever get to super ratings unless you've got national heroes. And, of course... With Ding now, and what would Ding like that? You know, got to offer? We know what a player now. he is. A national he's had to sit out a couple of frames where John has started to cure better and better. Against and I've seen him before in situations Michael like this where he's not at the table much. Sheffield, home of the world His body language can I'm here to interview China's tell you how he's feeling. Snooker, Ding he's a young man still. He seems to have been around forever. Saying we'll be practicing inside. He's just 21. So this is going to test him now that John is starting to play. When did you decide to move to England? I uh, came to England after 2003. Uh, so you're very young. He's uh, 16 years old. Big decision, a big move for you. Yeah, it's a big challenge because uh, uh, I, I have to come along. That's okay. How are you adapting to the culture and the language in Britain? First Just the one red available to him. Well, maybe one yeah, in either uh, corner pocket. Friend, uh, yeah. Uh, we talk a lot. We certainly one to the right and, uh, corner, and it looks as if one uh, will go into the left corner people. also. <laughs> <laughs> what do you miss about being at home? He's <laughs> looked at both of them. <laughs> you miss the food, <laughs> deciding which There's is lots the better of one to restaurants in Sheffield. Nicely on the black. <laughs> it's not yes, the he might be able to get, get across to play uh, the black into the same pocket. A little screw shot. My hometown. That's the reason his mum coming here. Happened, Seventeen. Because his mum is cooking the best. As well, yeah. Everyone loves his mom's cooking. Yeah. Every time his mom cook for every time. Just a gentle little Our translator here. for the day, Victoria Shea, works with the Chinese players living and working in Sheffield to help them acclimatise to Western ways. Thirty-four. She's also watched as the success of Chinese players on the world stage has inspired young players back home. You have to say like sure. five million at least just to Just ask if the cue would be clean. We've seen one or two bad contacts. These are the shots, little roll shots. Has that tend to be the ones. Is re referee Yan Absolutely. Bahas. Uh, like I say in 2005, where he beats I mean, the senior referee now in this game. He's one of the very best 